it's a great pleasure, in fact, an honor for me uh, to be on this stage with Walter and Michelle. I first discovered Walter's work uh, when I was a student, before I even got to graduate school. I lived in India and I bought a book called Personality and Assessment. Now this is a textbook and you don't usually find 21 year olds reading a textbook right through the night um, when it's not required for their class, um, but I did. And it's because of what that book was. It, was. it had ideas in it that were so radical for the time that it just made my head spin. And, and many years later, I came to understand actually the true importance of that book. But even in that moment, it was clear to me that this book was trying to tell us something different about what personality was. Um, that I had to shed the idea that personality was a set of traits. That to think about personality, I had to think about everything, about consciousness, a sense of self and where that came from, from all the things that were inside, but also the outside, the family, how a child developed in a culture, how world events would shape us as, as humans and that it was nearly impossible to ignore that these two were gonna be completely intertwined. This is a very hard idea, and Walter, your book, your 68 book, did that for me. So for many of those reasons, I'm just absolutely thrilled to be the person to um, ask Walter to say a few things about his own life and his work and how he came to do it. But before we do that, I'm gonna give you a few biographical facts about Walter Michel. Walter Michel is Niven Professor of Humane uh, Letters um, in Psychology at Columbia University, and he's been there since 1983. He studied in New York City um, at City College and at NYU before he went on to graduate school at Ohio State University, which is also my alma mater. Uh, he taught at the University of Colorado and Harvard for a few years, but he spent many years, 21 years, I'm told, at Stanford University before he got to uh, Columbia. Walter Michel ranks uh, among the great psychologists of the 20th and 21st centuries. I'll just give you a few of the awards he's won as an indication of how we regard him in our field. He was the first to win the Legacy Award of SBSB, the Golden Goose Award, which we will come back to because it's a very interesting award and we should know what it's for. The Grauer Meyer Award and the Wittgenstein Prize from the Austrian Research Foundation, whose significance, of course, will become clear in just a few minutes as we talk about uh, the city of Walter's birth, which is Vienna. Because of his deep and wide impact on psychology, Walter has been elected to the National Academy of Sciences, to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's a recipient of the Distinguished Scientific Contribution Award from the APS. He's a fellow, a William James Fellow of the APS, which is an organization of which he also served as president. Walter Michel is an intellectual giant, a great hero of mine, and of many others of my generation, of the generation of my students and their students and so on. So thank you, Walter, for what you've done, for what you represent, and thank you for being here. So let's get started. We are in Vienna, and this is where you were born in 1930. You were eight years old when the Nazis came to power, and you write that within a single week, you went from sitting on the first bench of your class to having to stand in the back. You joke that, and I don't know how you can joke about this, but you joke that it is no small wonder you, that you became interested in rejection sensitivity as a result of this. <laughs> it is, of course, to a reader like me, a painful story, as I imagine a very intelligent eight-year-old boy trying to make sense of a world gone mad. So I'd like you to tell us about those early years, the last little bit in Vienna, perhaps, leaving Vienna, Penniless, wandering, ending up in a poor section of Brooklyn. Well, um, it wasn't just moving, you know, from the first row in the classroom to standing in the back. That was already the good news. It was when the door was locked to the school for me and I couldn't go into it uh, that, the that the world really changed. Uh, and 
I won't go into the details of it, but it was not a good time uh, to be a Jew in Vienna. Uh, and um, the details of it are still complex, painful, uh, and um, I, I'm not at all surprised uh, when you pointed it out to me uh, that there is a connection between my connecting with Geraldine Downey to study rejection sensitivity uh, decades later. Uh, I had never seen that connection, uh, even though where I lived in Vienna was not far from Freud's house, so I should have That's right. you know, anticipated it. In fact, so it, it was when we were a, it, having dinner last night, the, the, the waiter we had told us that his son goes to the Sigmund Freud School. Yeah. So, so it, um, it, it was a, a, a very uh, sudden transition uh, from upper middle class uh, to no class whatsoever at any level. Uh, and it was also my first uh, encounter with the importance of luck which I think is an underestimated variable in human experience. Um, when, 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 uh, when the Anschluss occurred and the, uh, Hitler was hailed and greeted as an enormous hero uh, by, by Austria and certainly in Vienna, um, the automatic reaction uh, naively uh, was to start burning all the papers uh, that one had, uh, thinking that that somehow would be protective. I mean, the naivete and the idiocy uh, of the response on all sides uh, is something we don't need to go into. Uh, but the good news was that there was a piece of paper that before throwing it into the fireplace, I showed to my parents uh, because it had a gold seal on it and a photo and the photo was of my maternal grandfather who had come to New York in 1900 uh, and become a U.S. citizen and uh, uh, had come back then to Austria. And my parents and family had no realization of that. But that little piece of paper is why I'm sitting here and we're talking. Uh, so that's the beginning. And then uh, a period of wandering began. Uh, that uh, took a number of years uh, because my uh, father was incapable of uh, accepting or believing that this was going to be more than a momentary perturbation and that all would be well. So uh, we kept hanging around almost too long, uh, but got out just before Kristallnacht uh, when it was still possible uh, to do so as you say, uh, quite penniless, as I recall, uh, $7 uh, per child, $14 per adult uh, was what was allowed uh, for the exit, even, even as a derivative American citizen. So anyway, the wandering began, and uh, I, uh, I saw a transformation in my parents uh, that was remarkable, and that I think, again, since we're talking a little bit about the roots of one's work and of one's career and of one's ideas, um, which was that uh, as a result of the, of the Hitler experience, um, uh, my father went from uh, a very happy, successful, uh, positive man uh, to a, a, a severely withdrawn, depressed a person who could not accept uh, what had occurred, really, who was unable to recognize it and whose dream continued to come back to be uh, to come back to Austria. Um, my mother, however, went through an enormous transition uh, from being someone who seemed to have no purpose in life uh, other than to have the, uh, you know, the, the, the domestic help uh, really make sure that they cleaned the table properly and so on, while she spent most of their time lying on a couch with ice packs. And I think if we had been somewhat closer to Freud's house, she probably, <laughs> you know, you know, I could tell you stories about the analysis. Um, so she, however, transformed uh, in the United States, found a role for herself, uh, became, you know, the waitress and the, and the person who uh, made it possible 
uh, to have uh, an existence. So that's the, the yeah. upshot of now, the beginning. You know, there are many ways in which great discoveries in science come about. But what I love about the story that you tell about the transformation in your parents' personality is that it may have been your first insight into the power of environments, that the stability of what you had thought was a happy father and, may I say, a neurotic mother, ended up producing the switch in them in some ways. And all that had changed was they had had to flee their country. Uh, and well, I mean, I, I must say I can see that now, uh, but you know, it's an example of insight that comes afterwards. Uh, it was certainly not part uh, of what I was experiencing at the time, but looking back, it certainly makes, makes sense. Uh, but you know, if, if the question becomes uh, what led to the 1968 book and what led to um, a questioning of the assumptions uh, that, uh, that guided psychology. Um, that's another question that I think we'll come is, to that. Yeah. is worth talking about. So you are now in America, and of course, um, it's, it's a country that did for you as it has for many Europeans and many people around the world and continues to, and we hope will continue to, be a place where immigrants from all over the world uh, come. But even in America, things were not simple. Um, we have talked in the last few days about the 2% quota. Uh, can you say a little bit about what it was like to be applying to colleges, knowing that because of your membership in a group, the likelihood you would be admitted was small, and it didn't have to do with merit or talent? But well, just... I mean, I, I was happily surprised that Columbia University yes. admitted 2% Jews. It was, yeah. a, you know, it was a lot better than what the University of Vienna was doing at the time. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, but still, 2%. Today, we would, we're appalled at the fact that yeah. there was a quota on, yeah. on, uh, on any group, but yes, No, I course. mean, there's, uh, it's, it's been a very interesting um, mm -hmm. 87 Eight. years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And those quotas remained until not that long ago. No, I mean, not until that I, long I hear ago. stories all yeah. the time of yeah. people who say, oh, I happened to get in in spite of the quota because I used to play trumpet and the band leader needed me, so. But yeah, it's, a, it's, it's good. in fact, quite, quite I mean, my, quite you know, my, my uh, father, with the help of the refugee committee, at that point in Brooklyn, this is when I was starting to apply to schools and so on, uh, had a little store uh, that was uh, uh, five cents, five cents, 10 cents, and up. Uh, except there was virtually no up. It was, you know, it was uh, five cents and ten cents. And the problem uh, for me was that just as I was starting at Columbia, just literally as I was starting on a scholarship that I had won and got me in within the two percent, he had a heart attack, so I couldn't go. And then the next year, when he had reasonably recovered, because I had to work in the five ten uh -huh. uh, and up, and. Um, I couldn't get back in, so then I went to NYU, which is, uh, and um, I, didn't I didn't really major in psychology. I tried it, but I found it absolutely ghastly. I mean, it was. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Let's actually talk a little bit about how psychology was ghastly. So you're in New York City. This is what, late 50s? Uh, we're now mid -50s. talking about. Uh, mid 50s? Uh, I entered. Uh, I entered college in 47, okay. uh, so and then the and 50, then 47 to 51. Right. So would you say, so the, what's the scene in New York is the question. I assume there are things called schools of psychology, and people kind of affiliate with one of these. You're a gestaltist, or you're a psychoanalyst, or a humanist, or a behaviorist. Or, and you did encounter psychoanalysis. I assume that there were debates, and you tried to understand what, what it was and, and how it. Well, I mean, you. encounter it puts it very mildly. Yes, I mean, uh, <laughs> you, you immersed uh, in it. Yeah. I was steeped in it, and the uh, the experience that I had uh, as an undergraduate at NYU um, was I had a horrible course in abnormal psychology, which was completely just classifying people into categories that didn't make any sense to me uh, with no attention whatsoever to uh, either how you 
can assess them or how you might be able to help them and so on. So that was a total turnoff. Uh, I wasn't a psychology major. Uh, and then I uh, had an undergraduate course, which was really entirely uh, rats, but uh, br brainless rats. So it wasn't, it was even before Skinner really had his impact. So it was just sort of rats. Uh, just rats. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. yeah. <laughs> not even thoughtful rats. Yeah, yeah, not, yeah, you know, and, and there was no realization of how much of the genome we shared with them. So I didn't have the right mental set, you know, for dealing with them. So I got out of that and became uh, an English literature major and philosophy. And it wasn't until my senior year where you have to declare what you want to do that I declared that I wanted to do psychology, clinical psychology, and obviously analytic. And so I went to City College uh, from 51 to 53 to get a master's in clinical psychology at a time that the College of the City of New York had a fantastic clinical program. It only admitted nine students, uh, so it was very small. It had terrific people in it, like Gardner Murphy and um, um, Barmack, and people that you never heard of, but who at the time were very important and interesting uh, minds. The problem was that most of the teaching was done by people from the New York Psychoanalytic Institute, um, which you know I found fascinating. So it's not that I was fighting it, I was buying it. Uh, but the uh, turning point moment for me became when I realized that when questions were being asked, uh, the response was not to answer the question, but to get into the resistance and dynamics of the question asker. That really bothered me uh, tremendously. Why do you feel that way, Walter? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, to have it exactly right, including the finger, the tilt of the head. You know, exactly. Uh, you know. Uh, and I if knew, I had a cigar, uh, yeah, I, I knew exactly why I felt that way. Yeah. You know, be, uh, but then uh, the episode that really turned me around was uh, to make money and to do good. I was working as an uncredentialed social worker um, in the Henry Street Settlement House in Manhattan. And I was working at that time with, a, at the same time that I was going to City College and getting the analytic training, with uh, kids, uh, adolescent kids, who were really from very hard backgrounds. I mean, one of them uh, had a brother who was upstate uh, waiting for the electric chair. Uh, so these were kids who really were having a very hard time in life. And, one evening, I was imparting the latest wisdom that I had learned in my psychoanalytic training. And I thought, this is really wonderful, because I was surrounded by a circle of these kids who were breathlessly listening to what I was saying. And I was really excited, until I smelled smoke and realized that the back of my jacket had been set on fire. <laughs> <laughs> it's a true story. Uh, by one of the kids you thought was listening so intently to you. I was okay. giving the insights. So this was for me a life-changing moment. You didn't moment. need psychoanalysis to understand well, I mean, why I, that kid so, did that. So I decided to go to graduate school and that I really needed some training. The normal response I mean, yeah. when your jacket is set on fire. <laughs> go to graduate so, school. You know, so uh, I applied to Stanford, uh, which rejected me from, from graduate school. Uh, and I applied to Ohio State and a couple other places, but Ohio State uh, offered $50 more than the others. So my career, I think, was dramatically influenced uh, by the 50 bucks. Absolutely. We have similar stories. Uh, so Ohio State then becomes the beneficiary of Walter Mischel. And, and I, it's and beneficiary. You, and it you fantastic. of it. And really. so let's say, but it must have been very different when you got to the, to, I'll just say the Midwest, because the way psychology was thought of and practiced even must have been very different than what you'd encountered in New York. Uh, you had George Kelly, you had Julian Roeder. These are two big influences on you. So just, just give us a sense of what it felt like to be in the company of those two men. They're quite different approaches. Um, and yet you derive from each of them 
something very useful. That no, I took, I took a huge amount from them, and I've tried to um, give credit uh, for it. I think they were enormously powerful influences. Uh, they, they didn't connect to each other at all. As a matter of fact, they had offices on the furthest corners away from each other that they could possibly have had. Uh, and uh, it was very un exceptional or unusual for a student to um, go to both offices. I mean, almost invariably, students allied themselves with one or the other. But I kept shuffling between the two because I thought that together they had a decent story, but separately they were less than they could, could be. Um, I mean, Rhoda was, uh, I think, a giant in making it clear that clinical psychology had to be rethought. And his book, Social Learning and Clinical Psychology, which I think came out in 1954, very early 50s, I think is still worth a read today uh, because it really is an attempt to apply what had been becoming learned from social learning research uh, to thinking about clinical assessment and clinical problems. And George Kelly, I think, on the other end of the hall, uh, really um, anticipated the cognitive revolution by a good 15, 20 years. I mean, his work also came out very early in the 50s, the psychology of personal constructs. And I, I thought that that was fantastic. I mean, it was, that for me was a, a life-changing experience because it allowed me to also deal with personal issues by realizing you don't have to be stuck with them if you can reconstruct them, if you can turn them around. And that, I felt, gave, you know, to, a, to me as a really kid, a tremendous way of... Uh, kind of rotating, as he would have said, rotating the axes, you know, just switching it so that you're looking at a way that he referred to as more constructive, not more true, not, nothing to do with, with, with truth. It had a great deal to do with convenience. It had a great deal to do with what works for you. Uh, and that was an enormously liberating thing. So I feel that to, to Rotor, uh, I owe a tremendous debt in showing me the importance of two things, expectancies and uh, what he called RV or reward values. And the important thing really was values. He introduced values, on which there's a symposium tomorrow, uh, into the thinking and language uh, of, of psychology. Um, That's radical at yeah, that time. Yeah. Because uh, I, I mean, you know, I mean, when he was talking about reinforcement, he was talking still about pellets and goodies and so on. But what's the difference, what the unit is, as long as you realize it's the subjective value for the individual? Obviously different for a four-year-old or for a rat uh, than for, you know, other organisms. But there was a very exciting moment, at, and I think, again, a, a tribute to luck, you know. Uh, I think I was much better off going to Ohio State then uh, than, than going to Stanford. I, I, I completely agree with you, because at, at Ohio State, I felt that they just took you seriously and put you to work and felt they had a point of view to communicate and that you were there to learn. And, and I, I, I certainly was the beneficiary of that myself. Um, when I look at some of the titles of your first papers, you know, I'm struck by them. I'll just read some of them. Preference for Delayed and Immediate Reinforcement, an Experimental Study of a Cultural Observation. And this is something interesting, because you left America, and you went away somewhere, and you observed a very different kind of culture. And I'd love for you to say a little bit about that. Um, you studied spirit possession uh, in that culture, but you wrote a paper called A Reinforcement Analysis of Spirit Possession. Which was in the, in one of my first publications, I don't remember if it was the first or the second, but uh, it wasn't in a psych journal, it was in the American Anthropologist. That's exactly right, yeah. And then a bunch of papers on sort of delay in re delayed reinforcement. And so was it clear at the time that you were taking some of these so somewhat strictly behaviorist concepts, but into it, was being infused a set of things that 
would even today make Skinner turn in his grave if he heard them, right? I mean, quite, quite issues, you, you have a paper on social res, re, responsibility and, and, and delayed reinforcement. Um, it was, and the word expectancy, I would have thought that at that time, that was really creating the beginning of the cognitive revolution. So if you read a history book today, most graduate students think, you know, that was the behaviorist movement and then along came three papers and they made the cognitive revolution happen. I see it a little differently. I see it as having been going on for a lot longer in the work of people like you, and well, that eventually mother, yeah. something broke the camel's back. But, yeah. Well, my doctoral dissertation in 1956 was called The Effect of the Commitment Situation on the Generalization of Expectancies. So, uh, so in a way, really, you have a kind of a signature already of, of what then um, uh, followed, and I think it was the it was that Roder Kelly combination uh, that provided uh, the the context. Yeah, for, and I don't want this message to not sort of get through us. So I just want to re reinstate that graduate students have a lot of power that they can bring individual faculty together who would never otherwise be together. I mean, some of my most interesting work has come from a student who's connected me up to a developmental psychologist and so on, and I. Uh, I think this is a very important message for graduate students that they can do that. Um, well, in fact, to, you know, just to pick up on that for a moment, uh, uh, in the in the first psych review paper I ever wrote, you know, which proposed a set of person variables, that you know, the first one is Kelly, uh, and, uh, you know, the effect of of the of the construal, the effect of how a situation is encoded is the word I used, but encoding and construal are the same thing. And the second one is the effect of expectations. Uh, and the third one, you know, so really, um, the, the pieces of it, of the two combined, are certainly at the, at the core of the attempt to develop a reconceptualization of personality. Uh, Roder had never thought about it in terms of personality. He, he thought he was talking about variables. And, but the staying power of these ideas, construal, which we is still at the center of psychology, and I'm seeing a lot of reinforcement learning coming back in a very new form today. Several junior people in my department work use reinforcement learning as the model for moral cognition, for example. I would never have thought that 20 years ago. I would have thought that there's no way that that would ever come back, and yet uh, it's doing such great work for us again because those principles are very powerful, and. Um, computational uh, ways of, of reinserting them into psychology. Yeah, as, you know, as long as one can realize that the concept of reinforcement doesn't have to be pellets, or you know, it doesn't it doesn't have to be pigeon food. It can, it's really whatever it is that makes it happen. Uh, but uh, let me go back for a moment to the to the psychoanalysis and uh, how it's uh, how long it took to get away from it which I think was really what you were asking about. Um, uh, I'm very, very glad that I went into clinical psychology, although I really barely practiced it. It made a huge difference because both the exposure uh, to clinical populations and an internship uh, in places that then were called, for example, uh, the uh, uh, Columbia uh, excuse me, the, uh, the Columbus, Ohio, the Ohio uh, School for the Feeble-Minded. Yes, you know, that's was what one, it was called. Uh, yeah. you know, and another one for the, uh, for the insane, uh, that those experiences were enormously uh, important experiences. But the thing that really did in psychoanalysis for me uh, was the uh, internship experience at the Chillicothe VA Hospital because it, it showed me uh, how awful the application of psychoanalytic thinking was in stereotypic ways to every patient, so that whoever the patient was, they came out perfect in Freudian theory, or, or at least in this kind of botched version of Freudian theory uh, that was going on at the time. And there was zero connection between diagnosis and treatment. So I think, if, if I, if, you know, if you want to understand what gave you, you know, what, why you like personality and assessment as a book, I think part of what drove that book 
even if it's not talked about in it, um, is that rebellion uh, against the Kelly's definition of hostility uh, was hostility is when you're forcing something, you know, you're forcing evidence uh, into a construct and it's not fitting, but you're holding on to the construct. So you're really violating, <laughs> you're, you're, you're just pushing it and pushing it, even though you keep seeing it's not working. It's not working. So um, I think that that experience of uh, sitting uh, in the VA hospital and calculating what this thing was costing, you know, at the case conferences. It's a similar experience that I had when I was consulting for the Peace Corps, which was interviewing candidates who would be appropriate to go to, um, you know, to Africa. And what those projects invariably got was huge reliability and zero validity. That is, everybody agreed with everybody and it was perfect, and they got it dead wrong. So that's part of, you know, of what drove the personality and assessment book. It was sort of a cry against that. Um, and yet those ideas have remained for so much longer than you would ever think. Yeah. I mean, the fact that clinical training, uh, even well, today, has the remnants nothing, of that. nothing ever happens unless you get a better alternative. So uh, it, it wasn't really until social learning uh, became alive as a treatment alternative uh, and, and the simpler explanations of, for example, the, you know, Freud's classic uh, case of Little Hans uh, has been used by me and I'm sure many others as a demonstration of how a simple conditioning explanation of why this poor little kid who's being tortured by his parents and by remote control by Freud, uh, you know, who's being uh, accused by his mother of playing with his whittlet too much, you know. Uh, that's, I'm giving you, this is from the book. This is from, you know, it's from playing with his, okay. Uh, 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 and all of that based on the fact that he didn't want to go out on the street anymore after he saw a horse and a wagon overturned and the horse on its back dying. And then the interpretation that the father with the assistance of, of Freud gave was that, did you see that on the horse's muzzle, you know, that it looked a lot like a mustache and the mustache is the father. So when on the other hand, one could do a simple classical conditioning interpretation, poor Hans, who played with his whittler, it's true, you know, who didn't want to go out on the street anymore because he was traumatized by the horse falling over, which is a very hard sight for a four-year-old. Yeah, so people in the audience are shaking their head because they cannot believe this, and, and I, I think... Well, all you have to do is read, you know, read uh, the case. To read the case and then to also maybe ask what we are saying today that in 40 years to an audience sitting here will sound similar. Yeah. Uh, we have to be ready for that. Yeah, no, we have, to, we have to, to expect it. Of yeah, that. Yeah, we absolutely yeah. have to expect yeah, it. Yeah, that, that is great. I know you spent a few years uh, at Harvard and let me see if I can ac ask this question tactfully. Uh, would you say that it taught you about the kind of psychologist you didn't want to be and then you ran to Stanford as quickly as you could? Well, it's certainly true I ran to Stanford as quickly yeah. as I could. Well, uh, Boston was gray and, and yeah, San Francisco was yeah. a technicolor. For yeah, Harvard. absolutely. It was, you know, I, I, I was drawn. Not, not to mention that Leon Festinger showed up to pick you up in a, in a sports car, in a red yeah, sports in a car. red Mercedes with the red top Mercedes down. Red Mercedes. <laughs> uh, well, I was drawn to La La Land, you know. Uh, um, I think that um, uh, I was at uh, Harvard at a particularly insane time, uh, not just at Harvard, but in the culture, uh, because uh, I had the, the unique experience of co-teaching a course with Tim Leary. Uh, I don't know if this audience is too young to know who Tim Leary was, but he's the one who really introduced the counterculture. Uh, he's the one who uh, 
suggested to young people to, well, I don't remember to, the, tune, tune in, tune in, tu turn, in turn, on, tune turn on, turn in, on, turn on, on drop, drop out, out yeah. you know. Uh, and uh, so it was very interesting to, to have Harvard Graduate School, mm -hmm. uh, at least in my areas, go away from traditional training, whatever it was at the time, mm -hmm. uh, to become sort of headquarters for these packages that were coming from a chemical company in Switzerland and that were being delivered along with the mail, and it was LSD, of course. And again, I think you're speaking in code. This meant that class assignments were that you had to have an LSD trip as your class assignment. So, so I was very glad to go to La La Land. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what a boring person you are, Walter. Okay, so, um, so you go to Stanford and you have 21 wonderful years. It was a great department. Um, and it is there, actually, that the idea solidified into uh, sort of a, Well, it's a there theory. that I, you know, it's there that I had a unique experience that uh, I'm not sure how possible it is uh, currently. Uh, but the unique experience was to be in a department that gave me tenure uh, and allowed me uh, to have basically seven years in which to write a book because they had faith in me and in the book. Uh, ah, even though they hadn't so seen important. the book yet. So this is, it was really, I mean, I still had to do lots of other things and so on, but I didn't have this crazy pressure to publish and publish and publish, you know, uh, uh, just I mean, I've looked at your Vita, so I know that you were publishing a lot. And so I, I want to make sure that we get that. But, but you're right about places that explicitly say, doesn't matter if it's slow. Uh, as long as the issues, the issues you're working on are important and hard, and you're working yeah. towards having impact in some way. And I see a real difference between institutions that, that, that either allow that, and I would hope that more of them would, um, but, but with the threat to tenure in many places. I, I see this as becoming a rarer and rarer thing, and it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sad uh, but, you know, what, comment on our society. What, 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 what that faith allowed me to do. Uh, because, you know, the, the question that we've talked about just as friends uh, has been, you know, how do I, um, I get to the idea that the consistency of personality isn't what is intuitively assumed? Um, and it was, you know, maybe there was some cueing in the unconscious, you know, from my mother and my father and their personal transformation. Maybe it was from the recognition of how dramatically different things were when, as a graduate student, I was studying, you know, the lay of gratification in Trinidad and, in, in, and, uh, and Tobago and so on. Uh, so just exposure to different cultures, exposure to the institutions in Columbus, Ohio, that showed me, you know, uh, little little kids in an institution for the feeble-minded who were as bright as a button, uh, except that they were being made insane uh, by the place in which they were living uh, and being hosed down and so on. I mean, it was just awful. So uh, having those experiences was very nice, but then I started you know, to have a job and uh, in which, you know, you didn't take LSD to, as a class requirement. Um, and I realized that my job is to teach personality and assessment. So I looked at the literature a lot. And at that time, you know, you couldn't Google, you couldn't do any of this stuff. You know, you just had to go and get a journal article uh, or a book um, it was very different. In a library. In a library. It was a completely different way of thinking and doing research. I mean, I think the information uh, uh, technology revolution is fantastic, but the way I wrote, you know, my quote popular book uh, in two years ago and the way I, I wrote the 68 book has no connection. I mean, they're totally different experiences. So I started reading anything that had to do with personality in journal articles. And I saw a pattern that you had to be blind not to see it if you were reading the literature. Like the Hartshorn and May study. Well, yeah, starting with Hartshorn and May, but then end, the, the difference was that Hartshorn and May had 
a huge data set, and they didn't apologize for it. Uh, they, they didn't say, you know, maybe we made a mistake. They said, look at this stuff. And nobody did. Absolutely nobody did. I mean, this the is one, a study you know, in which, young, as I recall, young children. School who, children. School yeah. children would, would show great honesty in one domain, but not right. in another. They might right. cheat yeah. it on a test, but not necessarily you know, cheat on money or whatever. Or, or even uh, on, or, in another class. Or in another classroom, you know, not, yeah. you know, Not in French, but yes, in math. Yes, uh, <laughs> cheat in math. Uh, um, yeah. So uh, highly specific, highly contextualized. So that was just set aside. You know, that was just some kind of a problem you know, that nobody really was ready to take seriously. But then I looked at the endless doctoral dissertations and the endless other studies on traits and they all wound up, really, if you, you can go back and look at it, and at, with a conclusion that said it was an apology. You know, I'm sorry, my method, you know, <laughs> you know my, there was something obviously wrong, which is why I didn't get this. But the assumption of consistency was so strong that people reported their data honestly and said, you know, there's something wrong here. Uh, I did it wrong, you know, please publish anyway. Um, and, uh, but it, it, was, it was such a consistent theme that what was being assumed was not being found. And uh, so all I did in the 68 book was put it together and, and, and say one simple thing. What if it isn't the methodology? You know, what if it's the assumption that that drove the book? Yep. I love that part uh, because, yeah, so I assume this happens all the time, that, that there's dogma in, in little, even in a little domain. Which like, becomes it, the reality. Yeah, yeah which know, becomes the reality. Is, yeah. um, they're called alternative facts sometimes. <laughs> and and, and the, 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 the power of that, and I almost feel, again, I, I, I think these interviews of the kind we're doing, to me, their, their value is for a, a younger generation of people to whom some of this will sound surprising, and yet the question is, can it be applied to what they're feeling right now? And I think, yes, that perhaps one of the jobs of a young person is to say, they keep saying this, but the emperor has no clothes. That, I think, somebody who is not as immersed in the field can do with, with, a, with a clear eye that you were able to do because you hadn't bought into the dogma yet. And so that's um, a takeaway for, for, for me, yeah. So the response to that idea, the furor, the sides, I mean, how do you understand it? I, I have a very hard time understanding why there was the kind of reaction to it. Uh, why did people find it so difficult that maybe people are different in different circumstances, that, that, can, that, that social environments matter? Um, what, what do you think people were hearing you say, and what was it threatening when you, when you said that? What was the threat to? Why was that not? Kind well, I mean, I, 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 it's, it's a very, I think it's a very important question. Uh, I, think, uh, I think what happened uh, was uh, that the divide uh, between social psychology and personality psychology um, um, widened which was the opposite effect of what I was hoping for, which was that it would close. Uh, so to me, it was a complete misinterpretation by both the personality psychologists who thought this guy is our enemy, he's committing treason, he's saying there is no personality. I mean, that was the reaction of the personality side. And that was, again, if we go back, if we play psychoanalyst for a moment, modern psychoanalyst, and, and look at it in terms of rejection, uh, for me, one of the most painful things was to go to personality meetings, personality conventions, and have my friends not speak with me. And that's a fact. Uh, uh, have people that you think, you know, you're ready to embrace and say, you know, walk away. Uh, well, I'll remember that when, when, I, when I get snubbed uh, and say, <laughs> it happened to Walter as well. But, but I, I, think, I think the key is this, that the personality people thought it's an attack on personality. Uh, that, and that this guy is creating a person versus situation debate. 
the social psychologists were exuberant, but got it equally wrong, wrong yeah, exactly. equally wrong, yes. thinking it's all in the situation. Yep. And so why on earth didn't anybody realize that what the book is about and what the issue is about is person by situation interaction? And uh, Danny Kahneman has quoted to me something that his mentor, a Postman, uh, said to him, you know, an eternity ago, which is the human brain has not yet evolved to the point where it can deal with interaction. Yes, I was about to say that because I think we've seen it in so many other places. I think nature nurture is an, it's, it's oh, exactly it's in a sense exactly the same, the same. thing. Is, it's and it's the so main question: is yeah. it nature or is it nurture? I mean, these are the really the stupidest questions. That, <laughs> uh, I mean, these are 19th century questions that are still being asked. Okay, in the United States, what can you say? 60% of the people don't believe in evolution. No. Yes, exactly. So. So, right. No, I, I, I think you're right. That that's a, it's a, we should just be aware that it is very hard. I, I didn't know about Leo Postman having said that interaction is just Well, I'm hard told by Danny Kahneman. Yeah, to Dan, but, as told yeah, by Danny Kahneman. Right. Okay. Um, all right. Well, well maybe, maybe that, that helps us when we fail to uh, understand it. But I've seen this in, in a variety of places. Or, or, or something like you know, our, our inability to grapple with dualism. These are... These are uh, well, I, I think this problems. tendency, really, I think we can't, you know, obviously we can't, we can't overemphasize how easy it is to make dichotomies and how hard it is to really grasp what an interaction means. And it's, uh, even professionally, it's poisonous because if you come with a paper to, you know, to an editor uh, and it's got more than, you know, uh, gender or age or socioeconomic class or something as the, you know, they'll take one interaction, but come with three interactions, come with four, come with five, and it's crazy. I mean, you can't get published. There's too many interactions. You can't wrap your head around it. But I mean, the attempt to, you know, to think that you can do personality more simply than, than you, you know, yeah, than you can do a urine analysis. I mean, you know, people really think, you know, this, you know, you gotta have something where in 10 minutes you can figure it out, which is, of course, what's also been the fate of the marshmallow test, you know, where there's this over-interpretation of what that poor little thing, would, and the marshmallows are pre presented as if they're this large. This is good for the marshmallow companies, but it's not true. The marshmallows we use were this tiny, okay, deliberately to have a very tight conflict between one teeny little one and two teeny little ones. The whole idea was to have a methodology where there's a really big conflict. So let's, let's get to that because we don't have endless time. Uh, you've done so much work. You've published more than 200 papers in personality and social and developmental and cognitive psychology. But there is one line of work that will be most people's first free associate to the name Walter Michel. And that association is to a little round white edible, <laughs> and a marshmallow. Uh, so famous is your marshmallow test that in the week of the Trump election, the New York Times, the, the New Yorker carried a, a, a lovely cartoon uh, in which the judge is asking a- uh, At the Donald inauguration. Pardon me? Uh, at, at the judge at an inauguration ceremony. Yes, it's, yeah. it's the inauguration ceremony Donald Trump is standing there with his hand up, waiting to be sworn in as president, and the judge says something like, um, I can give you one marshmallow now, <laughs> or if you wait 10 minutes, I can give you two and swear you in as president. Um, and so let's, let's start with this basic idea of delaying gratification the whole arc and then the meme it has now become. Tell us how no, it I happened. Mean, the arc begins, uh, with, uh, uh, begins in the early 1960s when I was at Stanford and had three daughters closely spaced, you know, one after the other. Um, and these uh, kids went through something that uh, I thought was amazing, which is a transformation that anybody who has seen children develop sees which is uh, they go really from very impulsive and very immediate uh, 
still at about one, one and a half, and then at two, things begin to change a little bit. Uh, uh, as Mike Posner says, uh, before two, we can do anything we want with them in experiments. Uh, after two, they come in with their own plans. Uh, and I think that really by three, things start really happening. And then four to five is an amazing area where if you're not really, if you're talking years, you're way off. You know, you've got to be talking days and weeks and at the most months in, in order to analyze the data properly because what happens is fantastic. I mean, they become human. And uh, in that pro process, I realized I didn't have a clue about what's going on in their heads. How are they doing this? So that's the origin of the work. And uh, the intention was to, first of all, you don't get anywhere if you don't have a method in science. So I needed a method, and we worked very hard. I mean, the wonderful graduate students that I had in that period, uh, a couple of whom are already gone, I mean, passed away. Um, Abby Ebison and uh, Bert Moore, who died recently, uh, they were critically involved in this, and we worked very, very hard. So were there to get other the failures method. before the marshmallow test came along? Had you tried other things? And, oh yeah, and, and we spent four or five years from the time that I came trying to trying to get a microscope, you know, trying to find a method that would allow us to study what happened in my children's heads in that period. I mean, that was the goal. And again, Stanford at the time you know, allowed me not only the time to write the book, but the time to do these studies. Mm -hmm. I've often turned the Kurt Lewin sentence on its head and said, there's nothing so theoretical as a good method. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so finding, you know, and we tried, uh, you know, we tried everything. And we, in fact, it wasn't just marshmallows. We came up with you know, all kinds of stuff that resulted in my first grant to the federal government being rejected with with a very short comment that said they urged me to apply to a candy company. <laughs> well, you know I've told you, you should do advertisements for marshmallow companies. <laughs> but I want to make it clear, it's not just the marshmallows. The yeah, whole idea was to have the kids pick the goodies they want. Yeah. So if it's Oreo cookie, one versus two. And you know, we had these debates, you know, serious quote pilot work that felt endless to figure out, do we have, you know, a, a, a this versus another type? You know, do you, do you, do you change the nature of the, re, of the reinforcement of, of the reward? Or do you stick with quantity? And, you know, ultimately I decided that there's so much loose flying around anyway that we better stay with one versus two within one category that the kid really likes, really wants. And above all, to create a, a, a situation where, where you have a distribution. You know. Now again, we had the problem of an enormously homogeneous sample because the work began at the Bing Nursery School of Stanford University. It's a preschool that all my kids went to and they tell me that one of the conversations that kids had with each other there was, in which area did your daddy get his Nobel Prize? Which is, you know, which is not the usual uh, way, right? Uh, so that's why I'm very glad that we did a lot of those studies also in the South Bronx and that people like Stephanie Carson and colleagues have been doing them in other places and so on. And we so. now know it's a robust uh, phenomenon that captures something very essential about human nature. Now there are hundreds of studies you all did and thousands of more that other people have done, but the one that I think most people enjoy hearing about is your follow-up work with these kids. Well, I mean, the follow-up with the work with the kids, again, uh, the credit line uh, goes to the daughters because over the kitchen table I was, you know, chatting with them as they grew to become 10 and 12 and 13 in rapid succession. Uh, uh, about, you know, how's Sammy doing? Uh, how's, uh, uh, and they made comments. And at one point I decided, why don't I just jot down what they say? I mean, my daughters were not in the sample that we ever analyzed and used, you know, uh, but they were excluded. But I started looking and making small sample correlations that really was surprising. So by the time they were 
12 and 13, uh, I decided it's time to really take a look, and we found uh, interesting connections. Uh, I think, you know, th th there has been a lot of exaggeration of the magnitude of the effects, again, in the attempt to simplify things. Now, there were correlations, but, you know, there, first of all, the, the correlations come in what's called the diagnostic condition. That is, much of the work that we did virtually all of it were experiments. So if you're giving kids instructions that make it very hard or very easy as a result of what we're learning in the experiments, you're obviously not going to find out what the role of individual differences is because you've just, as an independent variable, suggested to the child, if you want to, when you want to, you can make believe it isn't really a marshmallow, it's just a picture. You know what a picture is. Yeah, it's something with a frame around it. Yes, if you want to, while you're waiting, you can put a frame around it in your head. And by doing that, the same child who's not going to wait fit more than 40 seconds uh, is going to wait quite a long time. And if you ask, how did you do it, Amy? The answer is you can't eat a picture, uh, which is, tells you something about George Kelly reincarnated, you know, uh, which is that the representation, the mental of the representation of the thing carries, carries the force. So um, if you look in the diagnostic condition only, you, you, you get correlations. And uh, some of the correlations are uh, impressive and interesting, particularly when they're on things like SAT scores or you know, in the early 30s uh, on things like body mass index, but they should not be overinterpreted. They should not be seen as, you know, as one's fate, because that's absolutely wrong. It accounts for still a small percent of the variance, and it's everything but one's fate. However, having those skills, having those skills, which turned out really to be what's now called EF, or executive function, gives people freedom, what I think of as freedom. It gives them the ability, to, you know, it, it means that they can transform stimuli. To me, this is the most powerful idea in this, from this work, uh, obviously, and I assume that's why you even chose to write a popular book on it, because yes. you realize that giving this idea and putting it in the hands of ordinary people will demonstrate to them the extent to which they have control yes, uh, that over, they can over, have over control. their behavior, yeah. uh, if not their minds, yeah. but certainly over yeah. Uh, the regulation of, of, of their behavior, and I think of that as and, uh, and, uh, you know, a hugely uh, important idea. And, yeah. and identifying a process that's still going on in other people's research, uh, uh, identifying the, the specific mm -hmm. cognitive skills that are teachable and that enable this kind of freedom. Absolutely. Now it's a, it's, 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 it's it's really, a result I mean, for the ages. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, if, you, if you think of the... Of, of behaviorism in its earliest simplistic forms, it was all about stimulus control. If you think about what's going on in that area of emotion regulation and self-regulation now, it's all about self-control. It's all about the way in which we can transform the stimulus so the marshmallows aren't controlling us, we're controlling them. <laughs> yes, great, I love that. Um, why don't we um, talk in the last few minutes we have uh, about the, the Golden Goose Award. You won it with a couple of your colleagues. With, with, with Phil Peake Phil and Peake Yuichi Shoda. Yuichi who Shoda, who were crucial to the work that you all did. But it's a very unique award, and I'd like you to say a little bit about um, what the award is for and, and, and sort of your own sense of the importance of basic research in the service of doing things that transform human lives to be happier and healthier and better, yeah. Which is what clinical psychologists are supposed to do. <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a, a, an award with a, a peculiar label, you know, the golden goose, because uh, there was a senator uh, quite many decades ago, 40 years ago, something like that, Proxmire by name, who made great fun, particularly of social psychological work, and uh, uh, created something called the Golden Fleece Award uh, in an attempt to sort of really uh, demonize and get rid of federal funding uh, for uh, 
psychological science work that deals with whatever experiments people are doing at the time, which has suddenly become a very timely issue again with the present administration. Uh, I gather there are problems not only in the United States on this, but, uh, but there sure are problems in the United States with it. And the, the uh, Golden Goose Award is an attempt decades later to identify work, most of which is Nobel Prize winning by other people, uh, but in psychology, um, they picked this work uh, as an example of what, uh, and it's in the Library of Congress, which is a beautiful setting. It's given actually by Congress, as well as supported by all the science organizations, uh, to, um, to honor research that is basic science in, in its beginnings, and that although they don't say it in the citation that NIH rejected and said applied to a candy company, uh, and that actually turns out to do something uh, for human welfare. So that's what the award's about. So. That's, that's wonderful. So you've mentored many people, not just students in your own lab, but you have been somebody who looks out for interesting ideas that, that, that you see. I remember your um, attention to work on epigenetics as being that way, your support of neuroscience. Say a little bit about the, the, the mentorship, the mentor-mentee relationship, but also um, what, what you would want young people in the field today to, to know about how to start to imagine themselves as young as they are as being mentors to people who are coming along. Well, I, I think what really uh, turns me on uh, is a young person's got a burning goal and that uh, they have to come with the passion. I mean, I can, I can try to you know, arouse a little passion, uh, but it's much better if, if you've got somebody who's already got something cooking, you know, something that they're eager to do. And then it becomes really uh, fun because you're trying to find, you know, a method uh, for, uh, together, uh, to turn that into a problem that somebody can devote a life to. And I think uh, great students, of which I've been blessed with many, really uh, many wonderful ones, uh, are the ones who, who thrive when they have that opportunity, which is you don't stick them into what you're doing. You see how what you're doing can help go with their goal, with their vision. Uh, Ethan Cross is one of my, was one of my last students now at the University of Michigan, who was an example of that, who wanted to understand you know, this idea of Susan Nolan Hexima, who's passed away about how if you, you know, if you, if you s start, you know, puzzling about something, ruminating something, how come some people get depressed and some people, you know, get over it? But what's the difference? What's the, what kind of thinking about what's bothering you is, is going to get you depressed and going the wrong way? And what kind is going to get you th the right way? So that's become something for which you can make a method, namely, if you, especially when you, when you make the connection. So, you know, if I've got advice of any kind, you know, the, the old uncle's advice, uh, uh, the, 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 the advice would be, first of all, don't listen to advice. But, uh, uh, but in case, you know, if you, if you would like a little free, uh, look for the hyphens. You know, I think what uh, people have asked, are you a personality psychologist or a social psychologist or a cognitive something or what are you? A developmental, you know, I really don't know. Or certainly a clinical psychologist in motivation. But it's about hyphens and I think this is very relevant, you know, to, to, to the recognition that, you know, if one had it to do, if I had a second life, you know, I'd be very interested in what's the connection between the biological immune system and the psychological immune system. Uh, how, you know, uh, epigenetics, yeah, sure, but exactly what are the ways in which humans uh, can use their brains to change which parts of their genomes are activated and which parts are deactivated? I mean, wow. <laughs> Uh, so it seems to me there are enormous opportunities if we can get over the rigidities of training, of again, 
putting people, you know, into students, uh, into molds and saying, you know, go do this because I've been doing it all my life, you know, so. Well, I was going to say that you are a national treasurer, but in the spirit of this international conference, I'm going to say that your ideas belong to the world, that you've helped us understand ourselves better, and you've given us a view of human beings as a constantly improving species. Uh, for this, uh, I am, we are all extremely grateful. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.